Hello, and welcome to our Advent lecture on Jesus the Messiah. We are so familiar with referring to Jesus as the Messiah, and often as well, Jesus Christ. Now we have to realize that Christ is the translation into Greek of the Jewish, or the Hebrew word rather, Messiah. So we can't just think that Christ is Jesus's last name, that Mr. and Mrs. Christ had a baby named Jesus. So rather, Christ is the Greek word of the title Messiah. And Messiah is a Hebrew, is sort of the English translation of the Hebrew word Moshiach. And Moshiach in Hebrew means anointed one. And in, from Israelite times, kings were anointed. The high priest would come and pour, pour oil over the head, and, and I mean really pour oil, all over the head of the man who would be king. And that was how that man became king. That was the coronation ceremony. And it was a good thing the guy was an adult, right? We can't do that as a, it's part of our baptismal ceremony, but you can't really, I mean, sometimes uh, people will pour, the priest will pour oil uh, or, you know, they usually do it with the water and they christen the baby with the chrism oil. But, uh, you know, you can't really pour oil all over a baby's head or heaven forbid it will get on the baby's face. And, uh, but for an adult, obviously, uh, they poured oil all over the head and wiped it off so the king didn't choke. You didn't want that of your new king. But we also must realize that the first anointed people in Israel, before there was a king, were the, high, were the priests. In the time of Moses and Aaron, the, and you can see it uh, delineated or described in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy, which are all part of what is known as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the priests are the anointed ones. And indeed, a priest, it sort of makes sense that an anointed one, a holy anointed man, uh, as in H-O-L-Y, <laughs> would be the only person authorized to anoint or coronate the king. And in the time of Moses, which most scholars believe occurred about in the year 1200 CE or AD, 1200 years before the time of Jesus, that roughly corresponds, give or take, uh, to the time of Moses. And that was 200 years, roughly, before there ever was a king. So the most holy, the anointed ones, arguably they're not specifically called messiahs, but the anointed ones, the first anointed ones, were priests. And then when the people were, and, and originally the Israelites were a loose conglomeration of tribes, the 12 tribes descended from the 12 sons of Jacob, who was also known as Israel, were would only really, they kind of lived separately and some of them had slightly different traditions, although they kept the major traditions of Passover and things like that. And they gathered for these major feasts and they all took turns taking care of the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments and the scrolls of the laws of Moses. And that was an honor they passed around. But they usually didn't gather together except when one of the tribes was at risk. Someone was attacking them, usually the Philistines. And then they would call for help amongst the other ones. And a lot of times uh, the other tribes would be a little iffy except 
uh, and this was the time of the judges. And we think of a judge as someone who decides in a law court, but, and some of the judges did that, but they usually did it amongst the members of their own tribe. But the judges were also people who were specially called by God to lead an army. And the most famous of judges, of course, are Samson, Deborah, and Gideon. These are the ones we're most familiar with, and indeed, they all led armies to defeat, the, to lead all the 12 tribes and to uh, defeat the Philistines. And then one day, a horrible, horrible thing happened at a battle known as the Battle of Ebenezer. The Philistines not only won, but they took the Ark of the Covenant because the Israelites always had the Ark of the Covenant at the back of their army, sort of God having their back, and they lost horribly and they fled, but they abandoned the Ark of the Covenant and the Philistines took possession of it. And this obviously you can see was horrible and dismaying and the Israelites were horrified and they didn't know what to do. And of course, God took care of the problem because the Philistines were gloating and they brought it into their capital city with great celebration. And God, God's a creative punisher. Suddenly everyone in the entire city was afflicted with horrible hemorrhoids. And they went to all their priests because they couldn't get rid of them. And they said, priests, priests, what do we do? How do we get rid of these horrible hemorrhoids? We have prayed to our gods. We have done everything. We have sacrificed. What do we do? And the priest said, well, there's only one thing to do because it's the God of the Israelites who we have ticked off. So put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart with donkeys, smack the donkeys on the bottom and send it back to the Israelites. And that's what they did, and their affliction cured. So despite God taking care of the problem and God returning the Ark of the Covenant, the Israelites said, no, 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 never again, never again. We don't care that God took care of the problem. We want a king. And if we had a king, the king will have a standing army, and the king will protect us. And they went to Samuel who was their anointed high priest, their anointed prophet. And they said, give us a king. Tell God, give us a king. Samuel warned him. He said, the king will conscript your sons and take your daughters as his wives. They said, we don't care, we don't care. Safety before rights. Oh, we've heard that one, huh? Anyway, letting go of poli our politics, the people said, we don't care. We don't care. So the first king that Samuel anointed was a guy named Saul. And Saul, the historians tend to think, only had, was more like a chieftain, and he only really had control of Benjamin, the tribal areas of Benjamin and Judah. And he ended up being killed in battle with his sons, primarily his heir, Jonathan, and David took over. David then became anointed by the prophet Samuel, the anointed prophet, anointed priest, Samuel. And so that became the tradition of the kings. Now, the kings were the Messiah. They were the anointed ones. And then finally, in 500 and, uh, 587 BC, BCE, the last king of Israel, the last king of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, was uh, his sons, were, were the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple of Solomon, destroyed the kingdom, took the last king, the last descendant of David in the line of David, uh, slaughtered all his sons in front of him, blinded him so the last thing he ever saw was the murder of his sons, and then took him back to captivity in 
uh, Babylon along with a great many other people, and there was never another king in the line of David on the throne of David. So time went on, and there was a brief period of time when the sons of Mattathias, known as the Maccabees, were independent, created an independent is, uh, kingdom in Judah, uh, in Judea, and they were known only primarily as high priests, but they were anointed, they were the anointed ones. But in 63 BC, BCE, uh, Pompey from Rome came to Judah, to Jerusalem, said, hey, you're looking at me funny to one guy and claimed the territory for Rome. And then Israel was never free until 1947. So during the time, by the time of Jesus, all during this time, since 587 BCE, when the Babylonians destroyed, under Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed uh, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, uh, everyone waited for someone in the line of David, someone somewhere with Davidic blood in them, would come and be their Messiah, be the new anointed one. In Greek, the new Christ. And this Messiah would free them. Now, we have to realize that at the time of Jesus, they wanted any kinds. There, people believed in different kinds of messiahs. There were people who believed in a military messiah, someone who would be the new king like David, who would raise an army and fight against the Romans and kick them out. And is Judea, Judea, the Jews would be free and independent again. There, some people believed it would be a spiritual Messiah who would bring the day of the Lord and peace and justice would reign upon the earth and the wicked people would be judged and the righteous people would be taken up into this glorious kingdom of peace and justice of God. Some of them believed that it would, this Messiah would be just someone who would God would help them somehow bring about uh, a new kingdom of David, whether militarily, whether the Romans would be converted, whatever, uh, and would just reign on some new glorious uh, throne of David out of spiritual conversion of some sort. And some people believed there would be two messiahs, right? There would be a priestly Messiah in the old tradition of an anointed priest and an anointed king. And that now we know that the history of having anointed priests who would anoint the king doesn't sound so strange. And indeed, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that the Qumran community believed that. And there were Jews in Judea who believed that. So there were different ideas of who or what or how many messiahs and outside of Judea who would be coming to somehow save the Jews and either bring about the day of the Lord, get rid of the Romans, establish the reign of a Davidic descendant and all different ways. Now, Jesus did all of those things right? That's why Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. Jesus did all of that. And in Jesus's ways, Jesus fulfilled all these expectations. He didn't fulfill it. Uh, he got rid of the Romans, but not militarily and not violently. Slowly, shall we say, because we have a God who's not in a hurry, slowly got rid of the Romans and the Roman Empire, 
right because through Constantine, the Roman Empire followed Jesus, became Christian. He was a prophet because he committed many prophetic acts, many symbolic prophetic acts. He uh, spoke to get the people's attention. Uh, he said things like, oh, if your eye makes you sin, pluck out your eye, cut off your arm. He drove the money changers out of the temple. And all of these things were designed to catch people's attention, to make people, look, there's corruption, look, you're allowing sin, all these kinds of things. And he didn't mean, yeah, literally, people should walk around one-eyed and one-armed. He was just getting people's attention. Look to yourself. Where is your sin? Look at the corruption in the temple. Things like that, which all prophets did. And he is the priest, right? He's the anointed priest because his, we are all his brothers and sisters. We are all in his line. And when we are baptized, we are baptized priest, prophet, king. And that's because Jesus gave all the apostles, all of the subsequent elders and leaders of the church, and indeed all Christians, that right, as the Gospel of John says, that right to be called children of we have the right, and that is the right of priests. That is the right of kings. That is the right of prophets. We speak for God. We act for God. We are called to speak out to the authorities, the religious authorities, the political authorities, call out corruption, call out wrongdoing, just like Jesus did. And so as, and then just in the readings now, we hear Jesus's genealogy. We hear it in the Gospel of Matthew. We hear it in the Gospel of Luke. And as a general rule, the only genealogies we ever care about are our own, right? We don't want to hear somebody who looked up their genealogy and Ancestry.com and go on and on and on on about who their ancestors were. How boring. And people will always say, oh, I'm descended from uh, the King of England, oh, Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Napoleon. Yeah, right. And how boring. How boring, right? Unless someone has some dirty little secret, right? Like, I'm Sicilian and I'm second generation Sicilian and one of my cousins dove back into all our ancestors and he found a secret baby of one of my uncles. That's kind of fun and titillating. He found back in Sicily, one of our ancestors was a mafiosa guy. He was a little capo, but then he got whacked. <laughs> so none of our other no one else in my family ever did that because obviously we weren't very good at it. <laughs> so those things are, yeah, if I tell people that, that's kind of fun. But no one else wants to hear I'm so-and-so, begot, so-and-so, and so-and-so, -so, begot. But as um, Father Mark once said, it's very important because in Jesus' time, you are known by your people. And it was also a political Thing. If you look in, Old in the Old Testament, sometimes people, uh, you look at people's ancestors, they don't agree. It's like, hey, in one place it says so-and-so is related to these people, and then in another place it says the same guy is related to other people. What gives? Well, it had to do with political distinctions as well. Well, these people were in power, so we want to make sure this guy is related to the important people. Well, now these people are in power, so we want to make sure we emphasize these other people they're also related to. And in Jesus' case, especially, interestingly enough, where the women, number one, 
clearly we need to establish Jesus' Davidic descent, and he obviously is. We, they, it's interesting about the women, because women are usually never important, right? In the patriarchal society of the Israelites and the Jews of Jesus' time, if a woman is named, wow, how important is a woman, right? That she actually got a name in the Bible. Usually it's this woman or that woman. The mother of Samson is never mentioned, right? Uh, it's someone is the mother, you know, oh, and that mother, you know, and his mother did all these great things, but it's his mother or this woman or the wife of so-and-so. We usually never hear a name. And if a name, a woman's name is mentioned, she's a big deal. I mean, we hear the wife of Isaiah is a prophet. We don't hear her name. We just hear she's the wife of the prophet Isaiah. But she's a prophet. We don't get her name. Nope. Nope. So having the names of women who were already named in the Bible as Jesus' ancestor is a big deal. And the fact that these women were kind of interesting characters. I mean, Rahab ran a brothel. Bathsheba was a rape victim. And uh, Tamar pretended to be a prostitute to get justice. Uh, you know, Ruth lay down alone in a man's tent to hopefully get him to marry her because she put herself in a compromising position. And his own mother looked like, you know, a woman who had misbehaved, shall we say. That's all kind of, hmm. But what we should realize about each one of these women before the Blessed Mother, who is obviously, you know, elevated for a good reason. All these other women, Rahab, Tamar, Bathsheba, and uh, Ruth, these are women who needed justice and did what they had to do to empower themselves in a very constrained society to get justice for themselves and their families, every last one of these women. So Jesus is descended by a bunch of guys. We don't know who they are, right? So-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And they're all names we can't pronounce, right? I, was, I went to grad school and paid a bunch of money to learn how to pronounce these names. No one else, can, and before that, I couldn't pronounce their names either. And we, they faded into history, right? Uh, who was this guy? What did he do? Uh, they're not even mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. We know who these women are. They're mentioned. Their stories are told. Ruth has a whole book, right? Bathsheba is the wife of the king, the mother of the king. Who are these women? Not just, ooh, shady women. These are women who did what they had to do to be empowered, to get justice. Those are the kind of women Jesus is descended from. Some tough, tough women. Some women who spoke out, who did what they could to get justice. That's some, that's some lineage. That's some power behind Jesus. And that, if we look at that aspect of Jesus' Jesus's lineage, and then we get to Mary, who was a tough woman, who took upon herself not just the grace of God, which she already possessed, right? God has already bestowed grace upon her, but she said, I'm willing to risk being shamed by society, possibly being kicked out on the streets because Joseph won't marry me and my parents won't give me a home because they're ashamed of me. And I'll do this 
because the world needs its savior. Whoa. So these are all women who took justice seriously and took salvation seriously. That's who Jesus is descended from. This, this is the blood that runs through our Messiah's veins. So Jesus as the Messiah, his human side is fabulous. We can see then that yes, his divine side coming from God, that is what makes him our divine Messiah. This, the Messiah who comes for our salvation, the Messiah who humbled himself to take on a human body. God doing that for us. God so loving the world. Not just God the creator, God the Father willing to do that, but God the divine son, the divine second person of the Trinity, willing to do that. What love, what bottomless love. I mean, what, what inconceivable love, right? We can't even imagine that kind of love. And then the human side of Jesus, having that kind of, as Father Mark put it, resume, that kind of blood in his veins to be the man who again and again and again chooses justice over safety, chooses to speak out at ultimate personal risk. Jesus, our Messiah. Thank you.